want to kick off. Uh, congratulations on all the projects. It's wonderful to see. Um, really is a truly diverse um, selection of films. Um, and I think really representative of, of kind of what uh, filmmaking, uh, black filmmaking is in uh, Minnesota right now. Um, just a wide range of uh, stories. Um, I want to talk first about kind of um, where the genesis of these projects came from, uh, inspiration, um, and you know the impetus for uh, for deciding to to do these. Uh, so Black was initially created because I saw the video of Philando Castile live on Facebook, and then that kind of sparked a, a pen to paper. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess that was that was kind of the the genesis of the project, and then I brought it to Tucson right away, and then it went from there. Okay. What about the Van Dusens? Uh, the Van Dusens was a. It started out as that first episode, just picking up a kid at uh, the the middle school, um, and I've worked at many schools and have kind of seen that transpire here and there. And so it started there, and I started writing it in like 2015. And then 2017 was a pretty uh, it's a pretty biblical year for me, and so I took a lot of things that happened from that year and put them into a scenario of what if um, that year had happened and I had a wife and two kids. Uh, and so that's that's where that started, and then what was supposed to be just a pilot episode turned into 30 episodes of that. So those are three episodes that you saw up there. Okay. And, um, and then on my end, it came from the perspective of not having enough black women on TV or in film, and also um, black couples. So I just really wanted to make something that was lighthearted that you rarely get to see because you know whenever you see black relationships, it's always tumultuous or very dramatic. So I just wanted something that was lighthearted that represented you know a segment that I feel has been a little bit ignored. Uh, it's funny because um, other than two, I guess E as well, I met, I met you guys here. And how um, Burner came about was there was a, um, a uh, workshop here uh, that SPNM put together. Shout out to Bianca. Um, and I met Michael Starberry, who's a Hollywood screenwriter. And uh, at the time, I had just start, started, like, seriously in film. And uh, I went up to Mike, and I'm like, hey, I produce films in town. Uh, so if you got, like, a project you, you want produced, you know, let he me know. He was lying. He was I was lying, lying. yeah. I, I never, I didn't even know what it meant to produce uh, Stretch, a project. Stretching. Yeah, I was stretching the truth. I was stretching the truth. It happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had all, I had every intentions of, of doing that though. Uh, and, uh, you know, he gave me the, you know, uh, you know, I see, you know, we'll see. And then months and months later, you know, we, uh, ended up like meeting up and talking and things like that. Uh, and uh, I got an email like months later with David, you know, CC'd in it. And it was, Hey, you guys still want to produce, you know, uh, my project? And I'm like, uh, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. You know, and then Tex and David, like, oh my God, dude, did you, <laughs> you know? Um, and then, you know, once once we got that green light, it was like, all right, let's, let's make it happen. And yeah, you know, David, he uh, did it with me. Allison uh, came in with us, and I think we made a really great project. It was really, made me nervous watching it. Made me nervous. Is this uh, is this your? It, it's not your first time seeing it, obviously. It's how many how many times have you seen it? With before? an audience, it is though. With an audience, it's my first time seeing it. Okay. Um, it, it was selected at um, the, the Twin Cities Black Film Festival. I've been kind of keeping it close to the chest a little bit, and I I was I was too nervous to go, so I actually did. Don't be mad. I'm sorry. I actually didn't show up. I was I was too nervous to watch it in front of people. Uh, but yeah, so this is my first time. I don't know if y'all saw me like in my chair like this. But yeah. So th that was for the 2019 Twin Cities Black Film Festival. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep, and Allison, when was your 
Um, so this one actually just finished in the last couple of weeks. Okay. Um, so I just started submitting to festivals. Um, but the festival that he was a part of for the 2019 was a different film that I had done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and Toussaint, when when was the completion? Oh, it's not done. It's not done. <laughs> <laughs> we have like three hours of like story. It's 30 episodes. Uh, it premieres Saturday, June 27th at the Parkway Theater on 48th in Chicago, which is a little bit serendipitous because when my mother and my sister and I moved to Minneapolis, we left New Orleans, uh, my, my family, my parents separated, we moved to 47th in Chicago and I, we would go to the Parkway Theater. And so here is you know this the premiere of this film with this in, interracial family premiering at the Parkway Theater. Uh, but it's, it's not done and uh, we're, we're still editing and sound, doing sound on it, and I'm actually leaving here afterwards to go work with somebody uh, on the uh, the score for it. Um, it's been rejected for most film festivals. It's been uh, pro uh, proposed to. Um, <laughs> it did, it, and which is which is totally fine. And that's that's that was part of the process. I was not ready for it. Like even like local film festivals were like, no, thank you. Um, which kind of like really like emboldens you to push further, but it, it recently was just at the Pan-African Film Festival in Los Angeles, nice. which like surprised uh -huh. the crap out of me. I was like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. So now I'm getting all these like emails like, hey, come to the director's brunch and whatnot. I'm like, I'm not there. So, <laughs> uh, But yeah, that's that's been it right now. But Saturday, June 27th at the Parkway Theater is where it premieres, and then it kind of rolls out weekly, like every episode will roll out weekly on YouTube and uh, Instagram and Vimeo. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And Pan-African is a dope festival. So congrats on that. I gotta go sometime. Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, David, did this premiere in twenty top of twenty nineteen? I feel like it was top of twenty nineteen. It was. It premiered at the Twin Cities Film Fest in twenty eighteen in October. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But maybe it was on Amazon. Did it? Yeah, it was on because we went to the Parkway actually in February of twenty nineteen, and then that same day that we uh, were at the Parkway, it, it was put on Amazon. Okay. So it was like, yeah, they accepted it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, this thing has been out for a while now. It's been a whole year, so. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I mean, it's it's. I'm obviously also part of the the screening. Um, yeah, you so are, man. Yeah, so I'm not sure how. He's been in like a hundred and. 50 million <laughs> festivals. <laughs> um, <laughs> how many laurels do you got? I'm on just that trying thing? to figure out. I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is how I'm going to moderate and answer the questions, and you know. So, so but, how did how did um how did uh, uh yeah new neighbors how how did the idea you know come to you like where did that come from? <laughs> See, Leonard's going. He want he's yeah, an actor he's producer. He's coming. He's coming. <laughs> This has nothing to make do it with that. You make it. <laughs> it's turned into moderator. Um, no, I mean, I, I was going to speak on that. I think it's interesting that you talked about um, Philando, you know, because um, for me, the the inspiration for uh, for New Neighbors actually came from reading an article about a woman who had gotten arrested out of her own home. Um, you know, and when she talks at the end about the fact that there's, you know, 19 police officers, the woman that had 19 police officers show up at her door. Uh, that's actually a woman in Santa Monica. Um, and uh, she wrote an article in the Washington Post uh, about you know, getting locked out of her house and then um, getting the locksmith coming. She went to work out, came back, was taking a shower and banging on her door, opens the door and there's a gun pointed in her face. She's dragged out of her house, thrown on the ground, and she's trying to figure out what's going on, asking them, you know, and, and they're basically like, who are you? What are you doing here? Why are you robbing this house? Who else is with you? Um, later, she finds out, she goes in, and gets the police report because they won't tell her anything. She finds out that 19 police officers showed up, um, and it was because her neighbor called the police saying that she was breaking into, into her house. And it's a neighbor that she, they hadn't met, but they had acknowledged each other from across the street. Um, and to this day, she still doesn't know why, um, why he did this. And so it just, it sparked. And for me, like all of it came at once. Like the whole, the idea for the film, I knew it was gonna be a film, uh, but then I wrote it as a short story and then adapted it as a, a stage reading. Um, 
and then wrote it as a screenplay. But uh, but that's that's where it came from. the The trick was to sort of keep it in my head because um, we were sightseeing at the time, and so I, you know, I didn't, you know, how it is. Like you, you get an idea, it's like, please God, don't don't go away. I can't deal with you right now. Um, and uh, and so all day I was just in a panic, and uh, and then got home that night and and stayed up all night writing it. And so, um, so yeah, but, um, but yeah, and then um, also the next film, Kian, is, is uh, also inspired um, by uh, the Trayvon Martin shooting, um, you know. So, so yeah, so this, this sort of inspiration from either direct personal life um, or things that are happening within our our community. Was it actually? Did you did you have them reference that it was raining because it just happened to start raining, or did you wait for like right. a little rainy day right. for that to um, happen? No. Um, the, what what happened was that um, the we only had one day to shoot, and uh, the next day the youngest actor was leaving to go college hunting. Um, and and it was written to be a, like a beautiful sunny day. Um, an actor showed up late, an hour and a half late. <laughs> and as soon as we started shooting, the weather app saying rain is coming, rain is coming. And literally to the minute, uh, it started raining. And uh, and Ray Burke, who is the older gentleman, the first neighbor. Um, he, he's my acting teacher, um, well he's moved now, but he was my acting teacher and he had to leave because he had to teach a class. And you know, it was like, okay, we're shooting. And Ray is super busy too. If you don't know Ray Burke, like he's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he, he was in Throw Mama from the Train, he was on Barney Miller, like he's, you know, seasoned. He was in Naked Gun and he played yeah. Pat <laughs> Shmia, the yep. villain in Naked Gun. Can you, can Not you say, a lot of people know that. They see Ray Burke on stage at the gun, yep. they're like, wow, that's a great actor. Like he was in Naked Gun. Yeah. Can, can you say that that name again? No, you heard it once. I, I won't repeat it. <laughs> you can look it up on IMDb. Yep. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So I was like, well, we're going to have to shoot. And then it was like, okay, Rain is going to have to be improvised into the film uh, because we got continuity, I mean, I, you know. So we waited out the rain and then started shooting again uh, about like 1, 1.30. So um, we, we did it on four and a half hours and it was pretty crazy, wow. intense, yeah. But that comes from rehearsal though. Um, and that's, that's a question I had, especially uh, both for Burner, um, but also uh, for Happily Married After. Uh, because it's it's set up to be um, a, a sort of documentary, you know, uh, pseudo documentary. Okay. Uh, well, how much of it was scripted? How much was improvised? Um, yeah. So both Jocelyn and Tucson did a really great job of sticking to the script. Okay. Um, there's maybe like a couple, 10% improvised, um, you know, with the arguments and, you know, some of the facial expressions and all that good stuff. So um, when it came to rehearsals, I think we maybe sat down um, one or two times just to kind of go through script concepts and just ideas of what we're trying to get out of, you know, each character. And then part of that too is just character building so that they understood where their emotions were coming from. Um, again, so just part of those two sessions. But beyond that, these guys came fresh they delivered on set and you know we kind of tweaked from there mm -hmm. and Van Dusen's too because Van Dusen's felt really loose um, now was that just in the shooting style or was it um, in in the rehearsal in terms of give, giving actors wide freedom to be able to kind of take it how they want to take it well it was loose because we, we shot with two cameras so we knew we were gonna get all the footage that we needed so it didn't really need to be as tight Okay. Like a performance to be like, okay, let's get the same exact thing next time. Um, but also between Brittany Benjamin and I, she and I went to college together. I mean, we'd known each other since like 2001. So her and I, very familiar with, you know, just when the next line's going to stop or when you're going to interject. And we, we, we fake argue really, really well. So it, it, there's, a, there's just a lot. I mean, that, again, like that's one-tenth of the whole series. So it, it's, we, we had a lot of handheld... Uh, between Anthony Cousins and Max Schoberg, 
um, and then some stationary uh, between them. But that the way it was written was also be loose as well, just kind of almost like David Mamet, like you know, uh, mm -hmm. interruptions and in conversations, and uh, you know, like just kind of uh, people being more guttural than actually literal sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Now, the Burner feels tighter and and uh, more scripted. Was that the case, or um, and it was also, I mean, it was shot in a way that is more moody than, uh, you know, the action is, is pretty paced and, and uh, mediated. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> it was, you know, we stuck to the script as much as possible. David shot it, so you, you and your moody, your, your, your moody, <laughs> your moody eye. Yeah. No, but um, yeah, yeah, so Chase, uh, is the other actor with me. And then Bruce is the guy that we kidnap uh, uh, at, toward the end of the film. Um, Chase, I met, uh, we, like the first play I ever did, uh, I went to college with him. So the first play I ever did, um, he, was one of the, he was one of the actors. And I think it was like his first one too, but he was so impressive uh, to me, and then um, I saw him again do something, uh, I forget where, but uh, you know, it was one of those performances where I'm, you know, I, I remembered him. So when it was time to find someone uh, to audition, you know, I, I chased him down. Uh, Chase, yeah, yeah, see what I did there? Anyways, uh, <laughs> his comedy special is gonna be on Netflix in yeah, about yeah, a month. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, <clears throat> if you miss it, I understand. It's okay. It's, it's, it's okay. I'm a dad, so I can have bad jokes. <laughs> um, and then, you know, Bruce, like, I don't know if y'all know Bruce, but Bruce is great, you know. Um, so it's kind of one of those two no-brainer things. Working with Chase, it was like, uh, you know, he, he was just the perfect kind of... Um, kind of youthy, uh, that naivete kind of thing about him, you know, that I think the character needed. So when we fed off of each other, it was kind of like big brother, little brother, you know, and then Bruce, uh, he was kind of in a time in his life where he kept getting these molester roles, and <laughs> he was like, uh, this is my last one, man. Uh, <laughs> he said, I don't know what people see in me, but uh, <laughs> I'm not doing no more of these. Uh, yeah, you know, so, uh, yeah, but it, it, I, I thought it came together pretty well. I thought it came together Yeah, well. and can I just say, too, on Burner, it was like when we got the, um, uh, the shot list for it, because... I remember uh, it was a lot of conversations between us talking about like, you know, uh, the timing of everything in the shot list was like very sparse. And I was mm -hmm. like, so we pretty much had that movie shot like, like super quick. But then I was always like adding more shots just on set. <laughs> I was just like, okay, now we're going to put on the 85 and do it from here. Now we're going to do this and do that. <laughs> we're going to get these close ups of this thing. And, you know, but it was, it was like, because if you if we watch the film the way the shot list was, it would be very much so like kind of like play driven. So it's a wide mm -hmm. lens, and then mm -hmm. them two just playing in the frame. I, if y'all remember that one scene between uh, uh, Leonard and Chase where they're just behind the car and they're just talking for that that one time, mm -hmm. um, it was going to be like the whole thing was going to kind of be like that. one, yeah, like yeah. one shot. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. But I remember just going in there and be like, nah, man, we need more coverage, <laughs> yeah. you know? So I Yo, just and, was, like, pushing that. And we didn't rehearse. Like, we didn't practice or anything like that with each other, so we kind of had to learn each other right, you know, at yeah. that moment. And speaking of rain, <laughs> yeah, we got rained out, and it was just, like, hours of, like, us sitting around waiting yeah. for the rain to go away. Yeah. That was a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> was Leonard practicing his lines? No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> oh, remember? Remember uh, 39 seconds? Uh, we did it. We did a, 
uh, film together where I learned my lines on set. <laughs> and never do I was that. The main if there's any actors in here, never do that. <laughs> don't learn your lines on set. Yeah, don't set. do that. That's uh <laughs> that's hard. Everybody's like, just quit, man, leave. <laughs> no, I, I mess with Leonard all the time. Um, that's my little bro. Yeah. Um so so yeah, I mean part of we kind of talked about this also just being a conversation. Um you know, uh, but but one more um, kind of more moderated question. Um, I mean, we're we're under the title tonight of the future of black film in Minnesota. Um, it's, what do you you know? What do you see has has a characteristic of uh, black film in Minnesota that sets it apart from from other uh, other work that you've seen? What what would you how 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 would you define black film specifically in Minnesota? Uh, I I think two is like the best person to answer this. What I what, what I'm seeing from you, um, you know, because here in Minnesota, you know, we're, we're uh, black people is a pretty small minority group of people. You see a lot of mixed families, and I think that that. Um, <clears throat> that story dynamic is is uh underserved you know and i think that you know just kind of watching what you what you got going uh, it's so funny because that ha I, okay my kids are black and filipino um they they look somali though it's it's interesting um so <laughs> what what happened to you at the school happened to me you know where you know i'm like hey and me and my son got the same name, you know, it was, it, you know, so like uh, this, the type of security you got to go through because, you know, you, going to school in like South St. Paul or, and, um, and uh, you know, asking for your ID and asking, you know, hey, uh, I, don't, I don't think you're on the, um, on his profile or whatever, whatever they call it or whatever. And it's like, no, I. I am on the profile, that's, you know, but the thing is they're not looking at the profile, they're looking at me. And there's, there's this, um, uh, this interrogation dynamic that happens in these schools. I'm like, lady, just bring my son, okay? But, <laughs> I can see the frustration <laughs> in your face all right now. Yeah, lady, come on. <laughs> Uh, just in terms of how, what do you? <laughs> I did no, no, no. I just I, I wanted to revisit it. Um, what? How would you define uh, black film in Minnesota? How how is it characteristically different from um, you know things that have come out of L. A. or New York or uh, even Atlanta, Chicago? Wait, that's that's not the question I answered. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think things that come I think black film that comes out of uh, or non-white film that comes out of other cities where there's a predominant where there's actually like a galvanized voice or normalized voice for people of color, it's different because it can just speak as it is. But in Minnesota, it's tough because there's not a lot of accountability by white people in Minnesota to take accountability for the harm or the damage or the suffocation of black voices in the state. Because while it's happening, while whiteness is happening in Minnesota, there's this reaction of, what? What do you mean? What's going on? What's the problem? And so when you're provoked to an edge, and then when you jump off that edge, and people play victim because they brought out the ugly in you, now you not only have, uh, you not only have to watch your temper when you're provoked, but you also have to be responsible for the feelings of white people when they feel uh, activated because they pushed you to the edge. And so with art, it's a, it's a tough push and pull because you're sitting here and you don't want to hurt feelings, you don't want to uh, you know, come off as angry, or you, know, and you, you may just want to show like a black couple normalized because it's not shown anywhere. And the, the tricky part, it's tough because as just like an actor in corporate videos and whatnot, I'll walk through agencies uh, that will be entirely white. Like I just, I literally just got out of uh, a shoot at Target and I, they got this big warehouse and it's literally all white people working behind the camera, on the camera, at the laptop here, there and there. And I saw one other black guy walking through and I was like, oh wait, there's another black, oh he's a model. 
And so it's this idea of they want us to portray a certain picture, but they don't want us controlling the narrative. So I think uh, in, in New York, Los Angeles, and Atlanta, in New Orleans, like you can, you can control the narrative. You can really get in, and you, you can have some, like, some, some sisters and brothers behind the camera and doing this and you know, calling shots. But here, it's to control the narrative or to even like, present yourself as somebody who wants to put hands on the narrative, it's almost seen as a threat or inherent danger to white people controlling the narrative already everywhere. I can't tell you how many agencies, thank you. I've been in many agencies. I was at an agency once where I did a voiceover and I was in a room full of white people and they said, I said, hey, I gotta use the restroom. They're like, all right, cool. I didn't have to use the restroom. I just wanted to you know, sneak around this agency. It's a huge, huge downtown agency. And I just, I, I walked around. I couldn't find a single person that wasn't white. Hmm. And these are hundreds of people that work at this agency. So the thing is, is that if you were a corporation and you wanted to go to this agency and say, man, I want to really fly advertisement, you wouldn't get a singular brown or black thought out of that building because they don't have any. And also, and when I look around, it's not like, it, you can't say, oh, we don't have any brown or black people around here. It's also when I see it, it's like, you, you clearly don't welcome or let any brown or black people in here. But now, the reaction would then be, whoa, 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 hey. And now I'm the asshole for you know, basically calling them on you know, you know, uh, ostracizing black people at the door. So to get back to the, the root of your question, it's tough because you have to be at all times on like high alert double consciousness. Because it's not enough, I think in New York, Los Angeles, and Atlanta, I'm just making a broad assumption. You could probably do some art and be like, you know what, I just want to do some art. But in Minnesota, it's like, I want to do some art. Man, and I'm black too. I got to think about this. You know, it's, it's, you have to be on your toes at all times. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, I, for me, it's like very heightened to, to, to put out work in Minnesota. And just to kind of build off of that point too, I still feel at least for the black filmmakers and you know in this community here, um, we are super intentional just because we don't have that additional privilege of just having that diversity. Um, I know that again when I you know cast is very intentional to make sure that I do have black people on my set um, and on crew. Um, so just making sure that we're really intentional about those because there's some things that you know most markets take for granted but we don't. But at the same time even with that lack I still feel like we're pretty bold in our storytelling because just about the time you know 2017 when we were all about met um, he had a film about a uh, police brutality. I had a film about police brutality. Yours is kind of similar to you know. So we're still getting those stories out regardless of the, the environment. So I, again, just saying that um, we definitely, I feel like we definitely have more intention just because we just don't have a lot of the luxuries that the other markets have. And, it, and yeah, and real, I, qu real quick, and it, it's interesting that you said that because um, I feel like a lot of the, the police brutality films, at least in terms of connecting with Black Lives Matter, didn't start showing up until like two, 2018, 2019. Yeah. So actually, Minnesota filmmakers were actually ahead of the curve, yeah. you know, um, which because you didn't really see like a it being dealt with on a, on television, um, at least narratively. I mean, obviously it was be dealt dealt with documentary and things like that. But it was an interesting thing I saw. I was like, oh, like Minnesota is actually ahead of this. We're actually yeah. telling these stories now, and it took like two, three years. Obviously, because it has to go through all that corporate stuff yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> before it gets it comes out. Uh, but yeah, yeah, no. And I was just gonna say, um, uh, Tucson makes a really good point because even when thinking about black, it was. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I was gonna do it regardless, but I did have a slight thought where it was like, this movie wasn't, hasn't been made, and uh, at least as far as I could tell, the only movie that was similar to mine was uh, Django Unchained and then Birth of a Nation, because I was making a movie about a guy who was going to, like, try to abolish the police, right? He's, like, what you might call an anarchist. So the movie isn't, like, a black person, his brother gets killed, and then he's, like, down in the dumps, and he's sad all the time. No, he's, like, building chapters with the Black Lives Matters to create this revolution that happens. Um, so it's supposed to be this what can drive you to something. Um, but I did for a, a slight second, and I got over it 
fairly quickly, but I was like, man, if I put this out there, man, I might not get no word from these white people. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, um, <clears throat> it's, it's interesting to hear it. Uh, actually, uh, David, you inspired me to write the film that I, I, I wrote last year. I wrote it in four weeks. Never wrote a film <laughs> before, ever. And uh, it's good. Like, it's not terrible, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I've heard. Uh, it's, it's good. But um, it's funny. When I sat down and I wrote it, I didn't care what anybody white thought. I just, I, I don't care. I think that, I think economically, I think that socially and in, ev in every kind of other way, you have to not care because, because if, one, you do care, and then, you know, what, what you need is maybe resources from them and things like that. It's just, it's, it's putting you in a position to still need, right? And for me, you know, the reason why Prince and, you know, these other guys were able to kind of write their own, you know, ticket on whatever projects they were doing is because they already had what everybody wanted. You know what I mean? So if you want to get in on what we're already producing, then you make the smart decision because somebody's going to do it or I'll put my own in. I mean, Prince was, was, was known for putting his own money in, you know, what he did. Right now, like you guys are saying, we don't have the, uh, the uh, resources to, to do it ourselves. That's why I really admire you guys because you put your own and uh, you know you put your own resources in your projects or you you know you find a way to get a grant or you find a, you know you you figure that out you know and i think that um right now that's that's what we got as a people in in art here is to figure it out until we can write our own ticket based on the merit of our own you know uh, uh, our own hard work hard work cooperation uh, and artistic vision of you know how we want to portray ourselves in in this uh, art form. So and to get to that point, it's it's tough because psychologically you have to be able to give yourself permission. Yeah. And when you see so many narratives that are normalized as well, you're not a part of this, or I've never seen a, a black female behind a camera, or I've never seen this is that or the third. It psychologically just tells you that you don't have permission to do that. And if you, you don't see it, then how are you going to envision that for the future? And so I see, like, to come back to the original question, it's like, in these other cities, there's already, like, given permission. Like, you just see, you know, Tyler Perry doing his thing in Atlanta and taking over a whole Confederate base and making a studio out of it. But here, you're seeing entire just swaths of, of white culture not only colonizing, uh, not, on, not only claiming ownership to media and whatnot, but also claiming ownership to the narrative. And so it's tough to, to get to that point of resources. Like, to, resources are there. Okay, can I give myself permission to go there? Like, psychologically, can I get past that point? And that's tough for, I think, for a lot of people, especially a lot of people of color in film, because they work behind so many white folks that are, you know, above them. And, like, how dare you speak to them like that? And I was, I was there's, there's a certain way you get spoken to on set. Like, you, if, you, if you rub that old white dude the wrong way, you were going to be seeing hell on set. And if there's a certain code switch that I go into when I'm on set. I, I go in there, and it's all white people. And I'm like, hi, guys. <laughs> and I just don't want to rock the boat. I don't talk to nobody a certain way. But then I'll see other white actors come in and just like, just lewd, vulgar, sexy, just crazy stuff Man. they're saying. And I'm like... I would not be hired here again if I was talking like yeah. that. So it's you you just got to like walk the line really really finely because you're not going to be given the benefit of the doubt. And it's it's just I've just seen it so many times. And so it's tough, but you got to get past that corporate point and then into the narratives that's going on here, like give yourself permission. And that's tough and I think what everybody's doing up here, especially EG, you kind of like grandfathered the whole situation, you know, like going forward to give people like, "Oh wow, EG does spoken word. Cool, I'm going to do that too." Oh, EG's making film. I'm going to try that out too." You know, like you got to see people doing it before you you bring your your body and your melanin into it as well. So where, yeah, where you get your inspiring. money from? Because that's no 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 no. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I want to. No, said, I wanna wait speak, a minute. I want to uh, speak to that. I want to speak to that real quickly. Real quick. Real quick. I and I was talking to a friend about this today. I think there is a scarcity mindset when it comes to making film, yeah. and a lot of people say, "Oh well, I don't got the budget for this," or "Man, I just don't got the people for this." 
you, and I know that you've done this before, and I know Yo has done it before, because I've, I've been on set with you. <laughs> Your butt. You can absolutely make a film out of nothing. Nothing. You can do it, but you have to be able to muster your own spirit. Like, you got to give yourself permission and hustle your ass. I mean, ask Alonzo Hester and his mother here. Like, I, I, I mean, I, they probably saw me losing it on set. Like, you talk about it being loose. Like, it was, it was like, hey, get, we didn't rehearse. Let's give it a, let's give it a wing. You know, like, like, but it, it's, it, it, it had to happen because I, you have to will it to happen and, and everybody has to be, you know, on your side to, to do it as well. But I think with, with film, it's like, yeah, you don't get the money or the camera. You can probably resource that, like, because this community is so vast and so yeah. giving and so generous that if you're like an authentic, like, just giving person, people are gonna help you out. Isn't that interesting? It could be giving and <laughs> simultaneously, yeah, like, stop, stop. creating. But this and and just to to you know, I I do I do believe there's a scarcity mentality, and um, you know, and I mean, for me to to answer the question, a lot of um, a lot of my stuff, especially film, um, or just being an artist in the Twin Cities, I've had to learn how to turn 15 cents into a dollar. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the the first spoken word conference um, ever. Uh, you know, we had fifteen thousand dollars, and it was a fifty thousand dollar conference. Mm -hmm. um, and and you only do that through community partnerships and and collaborating with people. We had 150 artists. You know. And I mean, we always have a, a commitment to making sure people get paid. Now, it might be a hundred bucks, you know. I know. But you know, I mean, and and it, new neighbors was less than twenty five hundred to shoot yeah. that, you know. I mean, and and so you do have to will it, you know. Um, the the brothers, uh, the pilot episode for the brothers series, we've only put out the prologue, but. That was less than a thousand, you know. So it isn't. I mean, it isn't like we're walking around here with money, <laughs> you know. You you scrape to get. I believe in the Robert Rodriguez principle, which is you figure out what you have access to, and who you have access to, and you write your work. You create work around that, you know. Now I knew because I didn't have the money. Uh, new neighbors had to be one day, one location five actors. Now all those actors I had worked with before, you know, so I called in favors. Uh, the, the cinematographer, I happened to meet through an uh, uh, artist that we were working with. Um, and he did it uh, partly because he wanted to get something for his reel. He had just come back from Taiwan, uh, had been shooting there, and he wanted to, to get uh, more stuff for his reel. So you, you work those kinds of things out, but also you do everything, you know? I mean, and this, that's the amazing thing. <laughs> I mean, you got writer, director, DP, uh, crew, I mean. You, I didn't want to be the DP though. <laughs> Let's get that straight. <laughs> just because you can do everything doesn't mean. <laughs> so, no, I'm just saying sometimes you have to. Yeah. But you know, this is a, I, the Afro should tell it all. This is a man of many, many hats. Listen, when, <laughs> when I was doing Happy Married After, I approached David. I'm like, I need you to be my DP, my lighter, all this other stuff. Because again, he is great with camera. He, he does beautiful lighting. And, <laughs> you know, by the time we got down to it, he was like, you know what? I can't do everything for you. So. <laughs> you know, but I mean, and Tucson, I mean, I've known you since I mean, the first time I met you was at the Walker doing the, the spoken word contest, the boxing yeah. spoken word thing, you know, which he won. Um, and, uh, well, you did, I mean, handily. Um, but um, but since then, too? I mean... I mean, he's he's been in bands, he's produced albums, and uh, you know, make music videos. He put out a whole sp uh, spoken word uh, film, um, uh, videos of different spoken word pieces into a whole film. Um, I mean, one of the most prolific artists in the Twin Cities, uh, just hands down. Um, you know, I mean, and. And, and I feel like that's part of, you know, I was asking about kind of what defines black film in Minnesota, you know, is that, you know, you're writer, director, you know, writer, director, producer, um, it's that multiplicity, you know. Um, obviously that is part of the definition of being an indie filmmaker, but I think even more so in Minnesota, 
partly because th there is that possibility to be able to, you know, the cost of living is not, ex you know, extreme. You know, you don't have to be in New York. You got three jobs, you know. Um, it takes all day to just to get to work and back. Um, so you have more possibility here in terms of being able to be an interdisciplinary artist. Uh, but I think that also comes to our work in that we end up knowing all these, you know, I mean, to me, I made a conscious effort of film is my final destination, so I'm going to learn how to write. I'm gonna learn acting. I'm gonna learn directing. I'm gonna learn producing. I'm gonna learn editing, you know. Editing was the last big one because I actually shot a film in 2006 that I couldn't get edited, and it's still shelved, you know. But I was like, I ended up going to New York to do an editing program so that I could f be in a place where I would never not be able to finish a film, wow. you know? And so you have, you have this sort of insane kind of multiplicity of things that you don't sometimes get until you get higher in the industry, you know, where you have made it, where then you can turn around, you got money, you can produce, you know, you can write, write, direct, and act in your own, <laughs> own film. That doesn't uh, happen very much. Um, but what, what do you pull from all these in terms of when you come to making your work? Um, do you find yourself pulling from all these? Do, uh, is the multiplicity, does that contribute to how you create the work and the kind of work that you create? <coughs> You're the most qualified. Well, um, it's funny you bring up Robert Rodriguez because I didn't actually read his book until maybe, well, I know it wasn't until after Black, so it had to have been in 2018 or something like that. Um, and I found it to be interesting because it's, when you see it, it's uh, it seems kind of dumb to me. Like, it's like you have all this money, all this resources, and yet you're doing everything. But reading the book, it was a lot different. It's like a lot more in depth in the reasons why he did it. In fact, there was a moment in the book when he talks about he was in art department, like in the art director, doing props and stuff for his own film. And then he realized how shitty it was and how it looked. And he's like, God, I'm really bad at this. You know what? I can't wear all the hats. Mm -hmm. And so he just didn't do it. <laughs> um, and so I guess, the reality is if you're like want to do something and you're unsure on how to do it, I usually say two things, either learn, so just learn everything so then you can be the sole person to do it yourself or tap into someone that can be a partner and help you. Now, this community is very, uh, well, at least the black community in Minnesota is very small and tight. Like, I mean, you can see from these films, it's like we all kind of worked on each other's projects, except for yours was the only one that didn't have any about, of us man? on it. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, like, you We've know. We've worked on other stuff. <laughs> and Allison's the only one that I haven't worked with. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as long as you, like, you know, as long as we're, like, available and, like, I got time, of course I want to help as many black people as I can, especially in Minnesota. So I, that's something that I've been trying more and more to do, you know, as long as I have the time. But it's like, I am a, a tap of resource. Like, when you hit me up and say, hey, who, what kind of people do, I send you text message with all the names and contacts because I'm not, I'm not going to hold that to me, you know. Um, and so then you can have that too. But if you really want to just do something, money is like, it's kind of the last thing, and it's it's just, I mean, I remember it so clearly on Rideshare, it's it's fun, and actually Rideshare, half that movie was in festivals we didn't get it into. So I think the, the short film was uh, $625, and I spent another $625 for film festivals that we didn't get into. So it actually wasn't even that expensive, but it was, I remember there was a moment with the car situation where I was like, man, where am I gonna get this effing car from, man? This effing, effing car. And I called my brother for advice and his advice was like, well, you're just gonna have to pay for it. You're just gonna have to get this thing. I was like, but what if the days move around, which they did, because again, weather here in Minnesota, which sucks. It's the worst part about shooting in Minnesota is the weather's so trash. <laughs> um, but it was like, 
Chill. But, but um, <laughs> I talked to Sanai, who was a producer on the thing, on the film, and he was like, who's in the back, and he was like, yeah, man, you could use my car, man. So it was like, it was all good. So it was like, that, that solved that problem. So it's like, make a movie, learn how to problem solve. What are the yes. problems in front of your face? Solve those problems and then, you know, move on from it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, like I said, you know, just a couple of years ago, I had never made a film before or I never produced a film before. I had just gotten into uh, film. I come from theater. And, uh, um, you know, I, I've learned from everybody here, you know, worked with everybody here. And, you know, I've, I've stolen a lot of things from these guys. I mean, there's... I, I, I'm a Sagittarius, so I can learn fast, right? I don't know if that's the reason why I learn fast. But anyways, um, <laughs> no, but uh, I, I learned pretty quick. So, you know, that time where we um, had to, you know, do Burner, I had no, I had hardly any production um, uh, experience. I had, I had David and I had Allison to help, you know, but... More than anything, the reason why I was able to to um, kind of fake it through was I learned. Like I went, I went out, I went and got books. I was on a YouTube, uh, YouTube University, the the University of Google. You know, I I, I read and um, you know and watched and learned as much as I possibly can so that I can be an asset. You know, working with these people because. They know what they're doing, and if you show up and and you can't help, you know, um, you can't offer any value to um, to a project because what was it, uh, the Blair Witch Project? That how, how much did they spend on that? Like, it was like six thousand. Like, was it even that? And then it made. It was less than seven. And then it made. Uh, well, Probably made millions. millions. Yeah, yeah, like like a hundred million dollars, some some crazy. The thing is, the value is what you put into it. It's not, and the last thing is money. You know, the amount of value that you put into a project. Um, and, you know, for some people, they have strategic distribution um, methods or whatnot that they may come up with at that time just because, uh, you know, of, of the many um, resources out on the web that are. Uh, that don't cost much or uh, or whatever. The thing is, though, is to be as is to bring as much value as you can and to see what you and and learn what you can. I don't know why I'm spacing like this, um, and to learn as much as you can so that that next step. So, for instance, um, I'm gonna wrap this quick. For instance, uh, with my film. Um, with this, you know, it's only been like two or three years or whatnot I've been doing this. With, with my film, this is the first project I've started and I have to see through. And the seven months I've been working on it, uh, we have people from Hollywood involved. Um, we have distribution. Uh, we're looking at, you know, money and things like that that I put together. And not too long ago, not too long ago I didn't know what I was doing. So I had to imagine, okay, what's the next step? How can I help my team, you know, finish this? And I have to learn what it takes to, to get there. And only then I was able to imagine and give myself permission, you know, to, uh, to take those steps, talk to those people and things like that. Yeah, and I'll echo the value of relationships um, because especially it being a really tight-knit community or a small community, um, I've worked with David on multiple projects, you know, his and mine, and, um, the value that he's been able to offer, you know, for me and I for him, um, again, that carries on project after project. So, um, and then expanding to when you're on other people's sets, because again, um, I have a full-time job in addition to this, uh, but again, I, I try and do what I can for other people, so it's not necessarily monetarily, because I know that, well, maybe there's some value I can add as, you know, a project manager or producer coming in. Um, so just again, trying to figure out, you know, what some of those strengths are that you can help offer to, you know, get somebody else's project off the ground, because, you know, maybe at some point in time, um, they'd be able to help you too. So for me, I totally think it's just making sure you're able to maintain those relationships and then, um, again, just being cordial with each other always. Yeah. And we, we have to, to uh, wrap things up. Um, but just, just real quick, um, 
in terms of what do you what do you see as the future uh, of black filmmaking in in Minnesota in in a sentence? In a sentence. Mm -hmm. Or two. Blacker than ever. <laughs> Blacker than ever. All right. Tucson? Um, I would say white people taking accountability and designating space that's not for them and being open to the possibility of not being in charge. I would say um, diversity in story. Because um, obviously, as black people, we've definitely suffered enough. Um, and as much as people need to know and, and hear and learn, and we're, it's not our business, it, I get, it's not our responsibility to teach everybody. It's fair enough to you know share that experience. Um, but again, I want to be able to make sure that they see the multidimensionality of who we are as black people. Uh, his, historically, uh, we're trendsetters here in Minnesota. Uh, so I think the future is um, we're, we're, we're going to be creating what, whatever the future of film is uh, in general. Yeah, and, and for me, you know, touching on a couple different things people say, um, one, uh, I do believe there's a renaissance, and I've, I've been saying it for a while, um, you know, of black filmmaking that's been happening in the last several years. And, and I just see that continue to grow. Uh, a lot of young people coming up that are uh, making films. Um, and, and defying expectations, you know, one of the things that when I go to festivals, people are just shocked. They're like, Minnesota, you're from Minnesota. <laughs> one is black people in Minnesota and they make films in Minnesota such oddities in the 21st century, but, um, but I think uh, continue to defy, uh, because I, I don't think people expect us um, here to, to be making the kind of work we make and as much work as we are making. Um, and uh, small but mighty, you know, um, we're a small community. You know, you were talking about um, sort of the, the dominant um, culture, the dominant narrative, so much so that it swallows up to the point where people don't know there are black people in Minnesota because there are not a lot of black narratives that come out of Minnesota. You know, I mean, I challenge the audience to think of uh, a, a, black, a studio black film that has been shot in Minnesota. They're white people. That's it? That's it, yeah, that's all we got. Anything else? <laughs> The Van Dusen's. Huh? <laughs> I was like, I was like, <laughs> the Van Dusen's feature is coming. <laughs> um, it's basically. But um, but yeah, but but that's that's part of what we are fighting against is the fact that there there aren't uh, nobody's looking to Minnesota for those stories and and you know my hope and desire and push is that uh, to create so much work in different kind of narratives, um, you know, being pushed to not tell stereotypical stories because often that is not the narrative of our lives here, yeah. um, that we force Hollywood and the industry to look to Minnesota. Um, and, and I stake a claim that within five years that more feature films, more black films yeah. will be shot out of here and also uh, a black series is gonna come out of here. Ooh. And I, I really believe that. Um, Fine. And it's what I, what, <coughs> To me, that we should all we are all pushing for. Absolutely, here here to that. Yeah, Black yes, Series, so. Minnesota. I'm 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 here for it. Yeah. Yes, we down. <laughs> Yo, we so down. if y'all got any money, oh wow, uh, to, to scarcity to make mindset. What do we say about that? No, yeah. I'm, we I'm, got it. We got it. And I mean, and that's the thing. Like you've already done. You know, I mean, that's one of the things I actually really commend you on is that you took that step to doing a feature film, you know, um, and, and really out there in the forefront. Because a lot of the feature films that have been done um, have been outside coming in. Yeah. Um, and we just produced a, a film, uh, a Minnesota-born director, uh, and, uh, but she, she's based in LA now, went to, I think, Brecht. Um, and, uh, you know, we shot it here in, in like four days. Uh, it's a beautiful film. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I really believe there's more of that, more of that to come uh, from 
us. Thank, we got to thank, thank uh, SPNN and, yeah, and thank, Bianca. Thank Bianca because she did thank this you. whole thing. So without yeah. her. Powerhouse. Thank you.